I'm of the persuasion that believers should always be pressing into God first for revival, then signs and wonders, healings, miracles, everything positive and hopeful right up to the moment of the rapture when Jesus appears to take his church, his bride away to his father's house. Let's continually believe for revival and lead great moves of God and press into the Lord for maximum results. Think of a gauge reaching 100%. It has been taking centuries throughout the generations, but soon, someday, the true church of believers will reach maximum fullness. And then, when the Lord is fully satisfied with the complete number of the Gentiles in the church, as Romans 11:25 teaches, He will come for us. So let's do all we can to be sure God's gauge reaches 100% and overflowing fast. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Many believers are pressing into God for genuine revival. The strategic hour that we're living in is not the time to be despondent, hopeless, and discouraged. This is the time to stir up our faith. In fact, it's thrilling to live in these days that could well be the end times prior to the rapture. But as even now we see the foreshadowings of the period that will be known as the Great Tribulation, we pray for the salvation of our loved ones and friends. We pray to the Lord of the harvest to bring to our minds and our paths all those with whom we should share our faith. For God knows who is open to the truth and who was not open at this point in time. Presently, God's hand is behind the scenes in international affairs, and he is giving this world a big wake-up call with numerous calamities, but these are only the beginnings of what the Lord Jesus called the end time birth pains. At the very end, birth pains come fast and furious in rapid fire just before a baby is born. And the Lord has also given us the primary end time sign, the blossoming of the fig tree. Israel is the fig tree and it became a nation again miraculously in 1948. We just have to turn on the TV or check our news feeds to realize that end time events are increasing faster than ever before. In the New Testament, 2 Peter 3.10 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Talk about global warming. And the earth and its work will be burned up. And the Apostle Paul also wrote to believers in the New Testament saying, let's not sleep as others are doing, but be alert and sober. And he said, while the world is crying for peace and safety, destruction will come suddenly like birth pains. So my question to you and myself today is, are we preparing our hearts for the second coming of the Messiah while Bible prophecy is being fulfilled at an exponential speed? Now, the historic announcement of the Abraham Accords, peace between the physical descendants of Abraham, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates, it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy for which we've prayed and longed to see. The Bible itself predicted that the Gulf states would come into alignment with the Jewish state. But it's not surprising that the leaders of Iran and Turkey are aligning themselves in opposition just as Ezekiel chapter 38 prophesied, because Turkey and Iran are furious that Arab nations are falling into place, being at peace, and normalizing relations with the Jewish state. It's very significant and certainly should be a wake-up call for the church that nations are coming into alignment according to Bible prophecy. The United Arab Emirates is basically inside the territory of biblical Sheba and Dedan, territory that was prophesied to be in alignment with Israel, according to Ezekiel 38, verse 13. And therefore, the Arab Emirates will not be a part of Confederate forces that will 
attempt to invade Israel. Those invading forces will include Iran and Turkey, and that's according to Ezekiel 38 and verse 5. Bible prophecy watchers know that eventually the Antichrist will confirm a seven-year covenant in the region, and that's according to Daniel 9, 27. And more peace agreements are in the making, and Saudi Arabia already will allow Israel to fly over its airspace, and this speaks volumes. We should look up for all of this prophetic news points to the soon appearing of the Lord in the rapture. Many Bible prophecy teachers are agreeing that the Abraham Accord between Israel and the UAE is a sign of the second coming. But before the Lord returns, first, prophecies in the book of Daniel, in the Gospels, and in the book of Revelation have to be fulfilled. However, the rapture, when Jesus appears suddenly in the atmosphere to collect his church, will be a signless event. No Bible prophecy needs to be fulfilled before the rapture, which is clearly described in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 and 1 Corinthians 15.51. That's why the sudden appearing of Jesus in the rapture is considered imminent, whereas his second coming to earth requires many more specific prophecies first to be fulfilled. Now, how do we reconcile the fact that the Bible appears to teach two aspects of the second coming of Jesus? Well, as we study the Bible closely, we discern that it describes a time when Jesus will come in the air to gather his church in the blink of an eye, whereas other verses describe his public descent to the earth visible to everybody when he sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives and when he restores the kingdom to Israel. The best way to reconcile these two contradictory seemingly comings, the rapture versus the public descent of Jesus, is to understand that these verses describe two phases or two aspects of the Lord's second coming. One has to do with the church and the other aspect has to do with the nation Israel. The rapture of the church comes first, when Jesus meets his church in the air to take his bride away to his father's house. His glorious appearing on earth later will occur seven years later, when he returns publicly to the earth together with all the saints to redeem Israel. The first aspect of the second coming is called the rapture or the catching away simply because the New Testament Greek word meaning caught up was translated into Latin from which we get the word rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 tells us that living believers will be caught up or raptured to meet resurrected believers and the Lord in the clouds. Both the rapture in the atmosphere and the second coming to earth explain how the Lord's return can happen both before and after the tribulation period, and explains why the church is not present during chapters in the book of Revelation that describe the great tribulation. While well, various men of God, such as Chuck Missler of Blessed Memory, Pastor John McCosner, Pastor Derek Walker, Pastor Andy Woods, J.D. Farage, and many others explain the differences between Bible verses that describe both the rapture and the second coming. These various verses tell us that at the rapture, the church meets the Lord in the air. Only the Lord's true believers will see him at the rapture. However, at the second coming, the Lord returns to the earth with the church, and every eye this time will see him. At the rapture, the Mount of Olives is untouched. At the second coming, the Mount of Olives is split in half when the Lord's feet touch down. At the rapture, the world is not judged, and sin gets worse and worse. But at the second coming, sin is judged, and the world gets better. At the rapture, the bride of Messiah flies to heaven. At the second coming, the bride descends to earth from heaven with the Lord. The rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment, but the second coming is not imminent. It has very distinct signs preceding it, which I'll mention in a moment. The rapture concerns only the saved, whereas the second coming concerns the saved and the unsaved. 
The rapture is called the believer's blessed hope, a time of joy, whereas the second coming is a cataclysmic time of mourning for sinners upon the earth. So the rapture and the second coming are two different phases with a time period in between. And these two distinctions seem clear to me as I weigh all of the scriptures and study them from Genesis to Revelation. But if you're confused, the best takeaway from this program would be just to be sure you're ready to meet the Lord whenever he comes and not to be taken by surprise. In fact, let's purpose to live in constant readiness for his coming. There should be no wicked way in our lives. If you invite the Lord into your heart, if you turn from any known sin, you can be ready to greet him when he appears suddenly, and then you won't be ashamed. Well then, ancient Jewish wedding customs that Jesus knew very well paint a picture of a pre-tribulation rapture. Recently, we watched the documentary called Before the Wrath that explains how Galilean wedding customs depicted Jesus' own promise that he would go away to prepare a place for us, his bride, in his father's house in heaven, and then he will return to take us to his father's house. Ancient Jewish bridegrooms came with torches in the middle of the night to fetch their brides and transported them like royalty lifted up on a portable couch mounted on two poles. This custom was called the flying of the bride as she was whisked away to the house of the bridegroom's father. It's so fascinating to me that famous Jewish artist Marc Chagall painted many works of art depicting a bride and bridegroom flying in the air. And my friend, Dr. David Pitcher, has written a book called The Flying of the Righteous, available at Amazon. I believe it's an e-book, and it teaches about all the scriptural references to the rapture, the important quality of godliness within the lives of those that believe in Yeshua the Messiah is also emphasized. Well, likewise, the documentary that I mentioned called Before the Wrath is all about this biblical typology of stealing away the bride, which was Jesus's picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. You see, there were several stages in a Jewish wedding, the first being the official betrothal, which was the actual marriage ceremony, and any breaking of the betrothal amounted to a divorce. The bride drank a cup of wine with the bridegroom, showing her agreement, which was binding. And then they separated for as long as a year, while the young man went to build an addition on his father's house, and the bride prepared herself. She didn't know exactly when the bridegroom would return, but at the sound of the shofar and with lit torches, the wedding party would approach. The bride would be snatched, and then they would celebrate at the father's house with a wedding feast that lasted seven days. Using these familiar wedding customs, Jesus taught about his return in his parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids that's found in Matthew chapter 25. Some of the attendants were ready in the parable, but others were not, and they were caught short, and consequently they were barred from entering the wedding feast. In the parable, Jesus said that five of the bridesmaids were wise, and five were stupid. The Greek word in the text is the word for which we get moron in English. Outwardly, all the bridesmaids were indistinguishable, but inwardly, they were different. The unwise, the foolish maids had no oil for their torches. Oil represents saving grace that distinguishes people. You see, it's not enough just to profess belief. Jesus said, we must be born again of the spirit of the living God. Well, in the parable in verse six, Jesus said, at midnight, there was a cry. Behold, the bridegroom comes. The point the Lord was making is that we should watch and be ready. He's waited so long to collect his bride, and coming at midnight means that his return will be both alarming and unexpected. Well, we're not the first generation to be looking for the coming of the Lord. Every generation has had this hope, except not every generation has had the sign that we have, the blossoming of the fig tree, 
the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, and the recapture of Jerusalem by the Jewish people. During the Middle Ages, when Muslims controlled the old city of Jerusalem, even they had inklings about the second coming of Jesus. And so they sealed the eastern gate in the misplaced hopes that they could prevent the Messiah from re-entering the city. But when Jesus returns the second time, no sealed gate will be able to stop him. The scriptures say he will come with power and great glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The glorious appearing of Jesus will happen after the great tribulation period and immediately prior to his promised millennial reign upon the throne of his ancestral father, David, for a thousand years. Well, as I said earlier, the rapture of the church is a signless event, meaning nothing has to transpire before it happens. But in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gave his followers at least six cataclysmic signs that will happen not prior to the rapture, but prior to his visible public second coming to earth. He said that immediately after the horrible and unprecedented days of the great tribulation, the first sign of his impending return will be the darkening of the sun. And consequently, secondly, the moon will not give its light. And then sign number three, the stars will fall, he said, from the sky. And he said, sign number four, the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then number five, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. Scripture doesn't tell us exactly what the sign will be. Some theologians speculate that it will be a bright and shining cross against the darkened sky. That would be very dramatic indeed, the cross being the sign of mankind's redemption. Other theologians speculate that the sign will be the bright glory clouds that will accompany him. Can you see how these cosmic signs are different from the verses that describe an invisible rapture? Well, sign number six of Jesus' return that he mentioned in Matthew 24, he said, then there will be deep mourning and wailing amongst all the nations on the earth, no doubt due to their refusal to accept his lordship during the unprecedented period of gospel preaching during the tribulation period by 144,000 sealed Jewish evangelists, also by God's two witnesses. And some speculate them to be Enoch and Elijah, or others say Elijah and Moses. And according to Revelation 14, 6, an angel will even be appointed to fly in midair to preach the everlasting gospel to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Yet it's prophesied that many of the earth dwellers will refuse the love of the truth and they'll be willing instead to believe the lies of Satan and Antichrist. And so finally, to their dismay, they will see the Son of Man arriving on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. During the tribulation period, the book of Revelation nevertheless tells us that after the rapture of the church, during the time of that tribulation, there will be a massive revival. Hallelujah. And it's important to press into God now for revival because remember, we want the body of Messiah to be enlarged at maximum capacity before the rapture. God has stated in his word that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Well, all of this global evangelism demonstrates the long-suffering love and outreach of God. God will be sure that his message is heard all over the earth. Genuine repentance implies that we're going to change our thinking in order to be transformed by God's truth. Well, one of the best love scriptures in the Bible that many believers around the world are clinging to is a very wonderful promise found in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, where God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. While we may certainly appropriate any verse from this supernatural holy book, the Bible, to gain strength and hope and courage, it also should be noted that this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, was written specifically to the Jews. 
Okay, there is an overflow of power of God's word, and it can apply to anybody who has the faith to believe. But let's not forget the context. God was saying to his ancient Jewish people that he has future plans for them that are extremely hopeful. In fact, it's no accident that the Jewish national anthem is called Hatikvah, meaning the hope. Jeremiah 29 goes on in verse 12 to say, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore you from captivity. What does God mean by captivity? He's saying he's going to restore them from the diaspora, from living as captives among the nations. And declares the Lord, I will gather you from all the nations and, and places to which I have banished you. I will restore you to the place from which I sent you into exile. And what place was that? The land of Israel, the Holy Land. So you see this beloved promise about a future and a hope. Yes, God has plans to give believers a future and a hope, plans for good and not for evil, for everybody who's adopted into the family of God by faith, but the context of this passage specifically refers to the Jewish people, to Israel. The church appropriates other verses to itself, such as Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, which says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. I love that verse. But the context of that verse in the New Testament is all about how the gifts and callings of God to the Jewish people cannot be annulled cannot be repealed nor recalled. One of my favorite Bible teachers says that the three rules of real estate are location, 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 and the three rules of Bible study are context, context, context. So many verses that Christians love to appropriate are promises that apply primarily to the Jewish people. For example, this passage in Jeremiah 29 was an oracle from heaven for the Jews. They just couldn't conceive how deliverance could come to them while they were in exile in Babylon so far from home. Yet this verse promised that their history as a people was not finished. God was holding out a future and a hope that a better time was in store for them. They had to wait for that future. They're still waiting. They're still trusting that God has not forgotten them. And he hasn't because he said, I know full well what my purpose is for you, a purpose of restoration for you, giving you peace and prosperity and an expected end. Hallelujah. Well, I enjoyed reading the commentaries this week. They're brilliant on this verse, describing every real affliction that comes upon the believer as a captivity in a sense. For example, it's a captivity to be held back from a great desire, or it's a captivity to be bound by a bodily illness or to fall into family or business perplexities. A captivity is when our circumstances go south. You've been carried from your Jerusalem of comfort to the Babylon of despair. But God promises it will have an end. Hallelujah. Not forever will we be in bondage to the weaknesses of the body, hampered by liability to disease, hindered by fatigue. Not always will we be at the mercy of unscrupulous and dishonest people. Thank God for that. And we won't be held down forever by the troubles that weigh us down here on earth. The commentaries describe a personal captivity like this. Perhaps we had been worshiping our reputation and lo and behold, an illness comes and lays us aside and we become a has-been. We're forgotten and new people come on the scene. But then turning from the dead end of false ambition, we return back to our trust in God who only deserves our worship and our trust. Or perhaps we've made an idol out of our business and now it's in ruins. Such trials teach us to see the futility of earthly things and to turn to the Lord for help because he never changes. We have to accept from our captivities a willingness to receive God's discipline and patient submission to him and to his leadings. For example, sometimes a doctor will demand that we cut out all sorts of indulgences and he might use severe and painful remedies to restore our health. And God also sometimes deals with us harshly, but he has in mind a future and a hope for us, nothing evil. God's thoughts toward his people are always thoughts of peace. He says to us in his love and mercy, 
My thoughts for you are peaceful and hopeful. He breaks us and bends us because his will is for us to comprehend the mystery of the gospel, that Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath on the cross in his body because of our sins. And that's why Jesus was able to shout in triumph with his dying breath from the cross, it is finished, meaning the work of atonement was accomplished for time and eternity by his sacrificial and substitutionary death. God says to us, I allow Jesus to die in your place for your sins. You're free to go if you put your faith and trust in him as Savior. Amen. You see, there was a divine exchange at the cross. God's justice decreed that Jesus paid the penalty for all of your sins and mine. But not only that, the perfect righteous life that Jesus lived on this earth was also exchanged for our unrighteousness. That's the divine exchange. The gospel doctrine of imputation. The Savior took upon himself our sins in rags, and he gave us his robe of righteousness. I invite you to receive the Lord and the gift of his righteousness. What a protection. What a Savior. The Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Amen. In the meantime, I invite you to please have a look at our website, exploits.tv, which reports on current and end-time events relating to the church and the nation of Israel. At our website and at our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site, we offer a library of videos 24-7, and we also invite you to sign up for our free electronic magazine called Exploits. That's based upon Daniel 1132, which declares that people who know their God are strong, not weak, and we will accomplish exploits, meaning we'll do the works of the Lord in the remaining time before his imminent return. I want you to please feel free to share your thoughts with me on the social media, or you can contact us on your phones or tablets through our free Jerusalem Channel mobile app. Well, today I want to leave you with Psalm 122, verse 6, one of my favorites, which instructs us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That Psalm says, May you prosper who love Israel and seek her peace and welfare, and may peace and security be increasingly within these walls of Jerusalem. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. <laughs>